whole idea when I was doing artwork was to do artwork that I would really like. So I have really nothing to compare it to. I mean, it's simplistic cartoon drawings. And my passion comes and goes. You know what, honestly, that's what makes it real. And what makes it real is that it's not fucking fabulous all the time. My style has not changed since uh, 86. And I tried doing some variations, but all look the same. You know, I think everyone's like, your hand has a personality. And my style and my hand have a personality. I didn't purposely go ahead to the style, it's just my style. I mean, but I like it. I mean, I'd rather people I knew who are graphic, uh, graphic artists, illustrators, much better artists than I am. Uh, but they don't have a style, they don't have a look. I happen to do something that is actually really hard, is to have a unique look. I didn't paint or draw for eight years because I just got sick of my own style and, and the work wasn't coming. It was just, you know, as about like probably five, six years ago, I started getting into it. I'm as busy now as I was when I first started, like in 1988. You have to keep yourself interested in what you're doing. It's, it's hard, because you know, I got, I got bored of my own style. And, and now, I guess, I just suddenly found out that I really like it. You have to just come to peace of what you do. Like, they're not hard to draw. They're just doodlings and like, I'll throw a wing and a mouth and then sort of just play with that. You know, throwing some eyes, some legs and seeing how you can make it a little different than the other one you did. It's just assemblage. Runt. I really like Runt's work, actually. I love it. That's kind of an understatement. Catchy. The colors, the animals, all together, I think it's very nice. The movement and the machines. Bombastic Kensington. Playful. Exuberance. Psychedelic. Humor. Funny, teethy, crazy. <laughs> because I've got a streak of being a social critic, and he's a social critic. I mean, it's some one thing that we had very much in common. I also saw the, the, the satire, his love of satire in his art. In there is a great love of humanity, but also an incredible sort of critique of humanity. His drawings tend to be mostly about, uh, you know, the relationships of items to each other or monsters or basically, I used to call them just monsters of the psych, right? Like cartoons of uh, the worst part of ourselves, our shadow side. He's made all the dark shadows, the monsters around us, in the brightest, weirdest colors, so that they become childlike and friendly again. It's a very uh, interesting way to get the viewer to accept the dark side of oneself, and uh, I think that's what it's all about. 
It's striking. I mean, you look at it, you wonder what's going on. It's kind of an alternative cartoon look. I love it. It's like Ren and Stimpy on acid. I will like all of them, you know. It is just like a story. It's a little bit messy and fun and, and doesn't really care what people think about it. Everybody uh, in his work is in process of, like, uh, doing something. If you were to, like, fast forward the mural five seconds, it'd be totally different. His design is, is uh, it's even balance. It's just full of stuff. From a distance, it's like a texture. It's just a wash. Before you see the detail, it's, uh, it's an impression. Part of the enjoyment is not paying attention to it. I don't know if it's best enjoyed, but it's certainly enjoyed without looking, just kind of perceiving it. At a certain point, you recognize it and you realize that the detail is there, right? And then, and then you become absorbed uh, looking at the detail and then you marvel and you fall into it and then all of a sudden there's like a little guy right there, you know? There, a lot of them have stuff coming out of their mouths too, you know, like uh, there'll be another person. The art itself feels like it's really spitting things out, like it's just kind of like exploding or kind of bursting out, you know? The other connection I made was to Hieronymus Bosch. They both kind of make hell look awesome. It's supposed to be bad, but actually you like it. Man, I, I guess I have a lot of good feelings about this art. Because <laughs> I do like the primitive look of art, so I tend to shy away from knowing technicals of, of like oil, and I tend to keep myself a little ignorant of it. Like it, basically it's draw and paint and black outline. And I try and keep it as simple as that. For myself, for my artwork, I think it's really good for me to keep a sense of naivety. I don't know really how to explain it, but I like the idea of it being sort of... No, naive is the best word to think of it. Naive, but, you know, naive with fart jokes. I'm going, I guess I'll uh, see you Monday. His work is very much outside of... Um outside of trends in contemporary art. When I think about who I would put in a group show with Run, well, I can't come up with anybody similar when I really think about it. It's very unique. Like nobody, I'm, there's nobody else doing anything like what he's doing, I mean. He has a very pronounced aesthetic. He's got like incredible composition. He's definitely got the thing. There are people that are like defined as street artists and that's what they're known as. And I think like Runt, um, through it, like common association, that's what he, he's understood as. Ultimately, he's a fine artist, you know? He's a fine artist who, who uses the, the street as medium. I think there's quite a few critics that by now would see this large body of work and, you know, find it very impressive. I know I do. something on a building and it goes I mean but also the buildings that they were there for at least five ten years I'm, I'm good with that I mean there's it's I have no control over it it's like someone tagging I have no control over that and also it should be enjoyed at the moment street art is not permanent art it's all it's gonna it'll evolve I mean it's gonna decay just because of it's on the street so you can't get that attached to it. I mean, sure, I'd like it to be at least around for at least four or five years. 
so everyone can have a look at it. But I mean, you 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 can't have an attachment to it, mm-hmm. you know, because they get old, and even just the atmosphere is outside. It's like uh, it's it'll definitely go. Like in the eighties, there was a lot of things like the, the wall, of the bamboo club, and um, some things on, on the Cameron and various walls around Queen Street and Kensington Market, and they're all gone now. But uh, in one way, I'm sort of. I'm not that bad because I didn't think uh, I think I'm a better artist now, so I'd rather have him gone. His aesthetic always seems to work well in the spaces that it it's um, rendered in, less in dialogue with other work, like other street based work, and more in dialogue with the people in the neighborhood. He's only been working in certain parts of the city that I know of, or I've seen these things where already there's a higher degree of fluidity and diversity. I think that Rent's murals, you know, they do have that sense of like misfit, you know, like not scraping against society a little bit. You can have a hundred figures in, in one of Rent's murals and they're all sort of contained within these small groupings, all of these small little pockets of individuals who like aesthetically maybe look the same, but are all actually existing on very different levels. That's kind of what Toronto is in, in, in to a certain extent. It's felt nicer than the real world almost uh, to me, you know, because um, it seemed to work anyway. I try to just do balance. And then also um, balance and luck, proportion with weirdness or color or whatever. And sometimes things just come up pure luck. It's sort of luck and working it out and just having an eye for it. Like it's just, you just, it's, it's instinct, it's sort of instinctual. I don't rationalize, I just, uh, I just do what works. I always have to have a project in mind. Like I never draw or do something for the sake of just doing it. It always has to be for a purpose. I, I drag my heels in the process, but I mean, that's where I get a real thrill. But it's just the process of doing it is good. First, I listen to the client, what they're interested in. And most times they give me free reign. Um, and basically I try and think of, like there's somewhere I'll try and keep it really nice and happy and cheerful, more family friendly and a bit more juvenile. And, but like this one that you're documenting now in uh, Parkdale, it's, uh, they want it to be a bit sicker. So there's more like, like blood and, like uh, like sort of human centipede ass, ass sucking and stuff like that and uh, or penises and shit like that. I, I always tend to th- throw a penis or a tit in some painters. I like that his guys, his, his creatures, uh, that they're not like good guys. They're not sweet, they're not cute, they're not photoshopped. It's like a big swimming pool, everyone can jump in. And I kind of like that about Ron, it's, it's very, open to difference and there is this like great sameness to them while they are so like not of this world and so like somewhere between a dream and a nightmare right oh they're kind of they're fucked up yeah for sure his work lends itself so well to gut reaction insane cartoon has come to life on a wall um and you you as a viewer have to like put that story together i think i don't think many people achieve uh that level of clarity about what their style is. Well, I originally wanted to be a filmmaker, and that ended up being a lot of work. Uh, and then I just eventually just, I always was interested in drawing. And then I tried to, uh, I went to film school, studied film, and I made a series of short little films. And then I sort of dropped out and just became like a drinking around Queen Street West. At the time, I was drinking at this place called the Cameron Public House, which was a big hot spot for uh, artists in the uh, early 80s. And actually, I just thought like it looked easy enough to do. So I just started bringing artwork into the bar and started hanging it up. And then they liked me. And then 
they'd let me hang it up there. And then I started getting gallery shows. I put on the first Cameron Culture in like these. So that'd be 87, 88. Uh, I remember the canvases in that were actually quite big and they were actually related to uh, drinking in the Cameron. More characters, more reptiles, more, you know. And they all looked vague, like people we knew. <laughs> and also back then in the 80s, you gotta realize that this art was considered almost offensive just simply because it was rude in terms of how bright it was. He was doing this before The Simpsons. And then people started commissioning stuff. And then I started getting murals. And it happened very organically. I never planned to be an artist. It just sort of happened because, um, I don't know, I think I just came at the right time and the right place. The young runt was almost like an animated cartoon character in, in himself. Like you'd open the fridge and like every single egg in the fridge would have a face drawn, drawn on it, like an oh no, or a completely brilliant visual conceptualist, conceptualist no matter what medium he was working in. I'll paint anything. I'll draw on anything. I, just, I mean, anything is a potential canvas. I don't think the thing that has to be on a canvas to be a, a piece of art. Like, I love merch. Like, whenever I go see a show or something, a rock show, I always end to the merch booth. It's just, I mean, you just lend your style to whatever medium uh, is good for it. I'm actually more of a lucky artist because people have uh, come to me with projects. At this point, if people don't show interest in what I'm doing, I won't do it. Oh, I recycle stuff all the time. Like I've got pictures of drawings I've done 20 years ago and I'll put them in a new drawing. When I was younger, I used to think I could only do stuff once and I'd have to create something new and that ended up giving me a great headache because everything had to be new. But then I, figured, I, I thought like, you know, I've created it, it's mine, I should use it, whatever. I mean, some paintings I've done like five times, like the exact same painting because someone liked it and I redid it. I have no problem with that because it's mine, I'm still doing it. But I used to have a real, this sort of like bullshit integrity in my 20s about everything had to be unique and one of a kind. But now I think that's like naive and dumb. It's like if you got something, and I created in the first place, so... And also some things help. I mean, I said, I've got, I've got my bag of pictures, and some are like from 89, some are from last week, some are from the, a year ago. I just keep them all lumped together. It's the same drawing, but there's slight differences in them, and it, I think they make a really nice collage. Like even this mural I'm doing now, like... I'll have people give me suggestions. I should put gang members in there. And, and like, I'm just polite. And I'll say, like, sure, sure. But I'll tell you, I'll, everyone gives me a suggestion for a mural. I say, of course, I'm going to put that in. Ultimately, you have to listen to yourself. You have to do what you think is good and what you like. You sort of get to know if, you know, you sort of get to know if it's good. It's so colorful and it's, it's not subtle. So it almost, I find it almost forces you to have a reaction. Like people think it's like stupid, sick, juvenile, repetitious. But I mean, that's, that's quite, that's, what, that's, that's the full spectrum. Like, what if everyone liked your stuff? It'd be awful. No, I, I, I get a kick out of the insults. The worst thing anyone can ever say about your artwork is that it's interesting, which generally means they don't like it. I think the one I did in the hallway of the Grand Electric was so odd. It was like so difficult. It was so angled. There was, uh, it was the middle of winter. I did the whole thing in a freaking parka. Uh, there was staff going up and down. I had ladders in the way. I had plates of uh, chicken broth going ahead. I had, I had trays of goat's heads going up and down. And it was just a real test of patience and time.
very, I mean, my stuff is very throwback to that. I mean, it's very, like, you know, it's, um, it's very, old, like, old style. I mean, that's my influences are old, like, old illustration. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very 70s-ish, 60s-ish, which is fine. And also, I find that my work has an aggression that's very urban. Like, when you get the country stuff, it's more subtle and calm, but where my stuff is more attacking and everything is either interacting or choking each other. So, and I find that's an urban, uh, an urban attitude. It's, it's very aggressive. Also, I, I am a total urbanite, and I grew up being uh, uh, into punk, uh, heavy metal and punk. And that was where my uh, thing, uh, my feeling go for. Because also, I was really excitable, like the energy of it, like the craziness of it. Oh, yeah, total carrot top. Like, it was like really, really bright, 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 bright orange red. Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't have red hair when you're 50s. Okay, now... The fins. Fins, 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 fins. What color to make the fins? I'll move on to something else. It will come. It's, there's not, it's not like uh I'm just trying to pick areas that have most the, the most white area. And then I'll take that and then I'll dispense it out with this. What are the three primaries again? Red, yellow. Red, yellow, Red, yellow, blue. Ah, there we go. I want to make turquoise. Many of the open mouths are, represent the way the consumer mind works in our culture. Stuff it all in. Mm -hmm. And the, a question for run observers is, is he telling us there should be no boundaries or is he commenting on the fact that there are so few boundaries? And I rather think it's the second because the, in, the, in the run world it is chaotic and confusing. Everything is devouring everything else. And it is an eat or be eat world. You might want to think of it as somebody who hasn't lost his child's eye view of the peculiarities of the human body, of human functioning, of penises, of breasts, of urination, because there are scenes of that, of eating too much, of vomiting. All these things are things that belong to the human body. And typically, we just don't show those things in what we formally call art. And Runt's boldness in showing this, of course, makes it, um, it's him unusual, but in a sense he's saying, here's the human canvas. This is, this is all about being human. And a lot of it's exaggerated, like a cartoon. A lot of it couldn't exist. A lot of it's like sort of fantasy. So the world of Runt, with all those grinning mouths, they aren't necessarily smiling. One sees the possibility of some malignant or evil aspects, but the, the canvas, the, the wall doesn't judge it, it just shows them. One of the common motifs is interlinked movements, organs stuck to organs, everything's hyperlinked. Makes it very modern, actually. You can't escape that. You know, it's, it's uh, overwhelming. You come off the subway, and there it is in the distance. Even if you didn't know the name of the place, you knew that mural. You know it's Lee's Palace because of the mural.
Lee's Palace is special because of that mural, and the mural is special because of Lee's Palace. They have a symbiotic relationship. It's part of this iconography in uh, of Toronto and in the Toronto music scene. If you count the number of times I've been in conversations about it, it's one of the most important pieces in the whole city. It has a stamp, a certain stamp of Runt's work. It's a beloved icon in general. Uh, not maybe. Maybe to, to fans more than bands, actually. He's attuned it to what goes on in that locale. That original mural um, just kind of aged with that building and like became this sort of synonymous image with with Lee's history. So when they announced that the mural was coming down at Lee's, it was very upsetting, uh, and then of course very relieving to hear that they weren't getting rid of it, that it was being redone. One day on the local blog, they put up a post about how they were tearing down the wall of Lee's palace these big pieces of art that could be, you know, about this big and some were massive, they were just throwing it out behind Lee's Palace of the Dumpsters. And that's what the blog post was about. It said, as they're tearing it down, all of these pieces of the wall are behind and people are coming to collect them. So I got in my car instantly. I brought my buddy. We just started driving over and we were looking at Twitter at the time, seeing people like taking, oh, this great piece and, you know, this nicely shaped palm trees tree piece. and. We showed up and almost every piece was gone, except this one piece that's behind me. And the reason we think this piece was still there was because it was buried under literally 400 pounds of wall, like concrete slabs and stones. When we brought it into where our old office and where I lived at the time, we brought off the elevator and someone saw us taking off the elevator. He offered us $10,000 for it because he knew right away. He said, is that a piece of Lee's palace? It sure is. And he said, I'll give you 10,000. And I said, is it not a chance? Okay, so this is the story of Lee's palace. I uh, was starting to do artwork around the Queen Street scene. Mr. Lee, a uh, lovely man, uh, asked me to do a mural there in 1986. And it was really simple, it took me maybe two and a half weeks to do. Three years go by and it's painted white. So I was going like, oh, that's too bad. And then I find that all these people are trying to redo the wall. And I started pitching Mr. Lee again uh, that I should do it. And that is how in 1992, 
I got to do the Lowell again. And then I did that and it took about a month uh, maybe a month and a half to do it. I sort of dragged my heels on it too. And so that is how it was for about 18 years till um, 2009 when the people from the Big Fat Burrito approached me and said they wanted to redo it. So we met and they said we'd like to redo it. And I said fantastic. We came up with a price uh, plus they pie all the, uh, the supplies and I'd have uh, all the burritos I could eat. I figured, I started in May, and I figured it would take a month and a half, to two months. Ended up taking close to five and a half months to do it because it got more intense. I got really detailed. I started to overthink it. Um, it just became more expansive, and it started just becoming this really dense, 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 dense thing. So it then took all the way down to August when we had to get a scissor lift. I have never ridden a scissor lift before in my life. And so, uh, and also I'm scared of heights too, but I sucked it in. I had friends drop by, saw people I hadn't seen for a while. Mural ended up okay. A couple of pigeons shit in my tongue while I was painting a few times. I got about five drops of bird shit in my head. Um, and that was pretty well the story of Lee's Palace. Oh, oh, I can look at that. Oh, well, we got the nice turn. We got no, that one over there? No, it's, it's after the hill. Up at a farm. Right. Oh, yeah, there it is. So when was the last time you were here? Uh, four and a half years ago. Good memories? Uh, that day we got, it was, it was fun. It was, we just got... Uh, we just got all, all into an argument, and uh, we got asked to leave. <laughs> and here we are, Paradise Farms. Is that the name of it? No. <laughs> Happy Acres. Yikes. See, now you can hear the dogs barking. Okay. So this is where I lived for a year in 2000. Uh, I've had some money. I stayed up in that room up there. Uh, and that was my place for a year. Um, I moved here in January during the winter. I'd be alone during the week was when Wayne and Aileen would go to work and I'd be here with the keeper Kenny. Uh, this place is absolutely amazing. It's one of the most beautiful farms. And there's actually snapping turtles that go in here. What is that? Oh! Yeah! <laughs> Especially down here in the summer, like Basically, we come down here, set up a tent, and spend the whole afternoon down here. Like, it's a great thing to swim at, and then you got the view, and it's... Uh, I got really fond memories of this place. Like, every day, my whole job would be to go up, go into the, like, little studio room, and to do one black and white cartoon on an 8.5 by 12 a day, and that was my work done. And then, uh, and then I'd kill the day by... Well, it takes a half an hour just to walk to the mailbox in this place. <laughs> <laughs> and then eating. It was like just really peaceful. And then the weekends they come up and people would come up and we'd party. And then during the week it's just more like quiet time. And then, but when I went back to the city, I totally hit the city running and started doing shows and getting a studio. So it was more like a, just a time to take back and like shh. Well, I met Wayne about 1989. I started going to this bar called The Epicure and it was run by a friend of mine so i started hanging pictures in there and then wayne who was doing really well like wayne's funny he was like doing super well like he was an advertising agency i took he took me up to his farm the first time me and a bunch of friends he rented a limo he's the first person i ever knew to have a cell phone so and then he started buying my pieces and i just ran to all this money from this art sale and i had about ten twelve thousand dollars and i knew if i stayed in the city he'd be gone in a few months so I asked Wayne if I could live up here for about a year. And he said, yeah, and the only thing is that I would um, buy groceries. 
uh, which I sort of didn't do all the time. And uh, then I actually stayed up here for one calendar year. And yeah, and, Cor and I guess the dogs. <laughs> they will come with us? Um, I don't know. They might not, they're, they're all old dogs. They're like, they just... was in the advertising. I don't know if he's still quite doing advertising now. But uh, when he started, he was trying to get me into doing various of things. One's fun is this is a thing called, tell it, it's called Sports Crunch. It was supposed to be a, um, potato, a, a chips. potato chips. It's, uh, and so I did this. I completely forgot about this. This was Alex's Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it never did make it to color. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's the one thing he, uh, Got me to get a page in this um, illustration magazine, and oh. then uh, and then didn't pay for it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it gets worse. Oh, oh, that's the dogs. Well, it's uh, a little different. It is. This is you, the original East Palace. Oh. Yeah, this is the oh, very. The this, I don't think you saw this. This oh, is the very this, first oh, one. Okay. Well, actually, Wayne coined the phrase that least Palace guy. And that was around the time. If you have the uh, cover of it, that was like shortly after 9/11. They sell them. You sell them. Yeah, oh. you sell them. It's a package. So there's like maybe five or five different gift cards that they give away. And they're all different. This is not about Wayne's idea for run. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's, it's, about, it's about making you money. Yeah, but today... It'll soon. make you money. I'm not arguing that. Because but right now, this is about a documentary on me, not your sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, it was a surprise. It was. I was out of the blue. I didn't. I did not expect uh, to be uh, given a Prezi like that. No. Oh, I loved it. I love it. It's mine. It's my runt. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> it's great having a look at something because also it's something you take great pride in. Sometimes you forget how actually sort of good you were at a certain time, certain point of time. Right now, I mean, like. I'm totally comfortable who I am. I'm totally comfortable in the history of the art I've, I've produced. I'll stress over the work, what I'm doing, and, and, and to make sure it's good. But I don't. I'm, I don't. Uh, I'm not going to kill myself over it like I I used to. It's, I'm too happy now. I got too many things I like in life.
Well, uh, you know, okay, at the risk of sounding absolutely mad, uh, the demonology, perhaps. I mean, because what else is it? We're, we're seeing a bunch of characters that are far less than human. The idea that you can look at a piece like this and just completely lose yourself in non-reality. Uh, that's, the, that's the attraction of all good fiction. I think he's very well aware of the fact that he's producing fiction. It's, yes, it's fictional iconography because his work progresses so quickly, deceptively fast by blocking in characters. They don't really speak until he's colored them in. And so you finally, you find yourself overwhelmed by the piece before you even know it's there. If you like it or don't like it, not his concern. But at the same time, he knows that he's doing something important. This is just too much fun, you know? Isn't I mean, I, I look at this and I say, wow, I wish I could wall, buy wallpaper like this and just put it up, you know? So we got him? Yep. Off we go. <laughs> Al's probably the greatest punk rock musician that ever lived that never had a band. His art reflects kind of the wildness of the city and the underground music scene. You know, it goes both ways because the music scene are also huge fans of him. I fell in love with his work when I was a kid and later on in life I said I wanted to have a piece and I hunted one down and now I have it hanging on my living room wall. He originally made it for The Edge 102.1. They wanted to do a promo piece with this piece of art. When I have guests over, I can always tell who are from Toronto and who are not. Uh, the people that are from Toronto immediately fall in love with it and a lot of them say, that's a runt. Then I'll have somebody come in from somewhere else and they'll be like, wow, that's a really interesting piece of art. And you know that they're not from Toronto. Right now, Al is very popular because of all the amazing stuff that he's done. It's not just a, a mural at Lee's Palace. The guy has history in the city. I got the, my piece uh, in about 2010 or 11. It was actually once I had become a city councillor and I was in another councillor's office who um, actually um, rotates different artists through. And I was like, that's runt. I wanted that looked like urban, and so it has kind of buildings in it. Then it has like this kind of overlay of the characters. I mean, one guy looks exhausted, right? He's exhausted by the, the rat race or whatever it might be. The gun character, and especially the job I'm in, like I see the kind of that bad side of Toronto in a really tragic, violent way, and it's awful, but it's also something that I think at times we try and sweep under the rug a bit. And, and this was a piece that was going to be in you know, a city councillor's office or my home with little kids. Part of me was like, oh, am I being a bad parent by exposing them to that kind of imagery? But at the same time, I want them to see all sides of this city, right? If I picture a city, and you know, Toronto's the one I know, and I, I almost picture the city as someone's drawn in black and white. And that's what we build, you know, and that's what City Hall does and people to build buildings do. To me, he's kind of colors it in. And I know that's like, it totally changes the landscape of the city. And for the person who has, to, who has the pleasure of walking by a piece of his, as opposed to a gray wall. Uh, of course, I've known Runt from Lee's Palace before I'd actually met him. Everyone has sort of seen that mural going to shows and concert at Lee's over the years. And eventually, uh, I convinced him that he needed to come and do a mural in my backyard. And he sort of thought I was crazy, like, why would you want one of my murals in, my, in, in your backyard? Can, I can't give you a sketch, I don't know what it's going to be, it just comes out of my mind, it flows out of me. And I said, that's exactly what I want you to do. The kids in the neighborhood love this, when they come back here and take a look and go, this guy has two heads, three eyeballs, three beaks, four mouths, you know, it's so much fun, it really uh, shows his sense of humor. We're building a new garage next year, and I can't wait to get it in the laneway out back because then all the kids will really have access to it. His stuff is very unique. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. I do posts of art. Like recently I've gotten, I've discovered graffiti and I really like graffiti. So I created an Instagram account just for that called uh, pretty underscore graffiti. Um, so, like all the other guys are doing like real stuff. They're putting pictures of 
Toronto were drawing real faces, we'll run, we'll do, uh, make up these characters and put them into his mural. I think he, he really likes, uh, doing, like, fiction characters, and, uh, he'll do crazy scenes that half of the parts you can't even understand, so sometimes it will be, uh, sometimes there will be, like, a a guy with a helicopter on his head, but you, you, you're like, what? And then there will be like a giant monster trying to swallow a cash machine or something, so. This morning I got it from my dad for Christmas. Um, just like thanked him so much and I liked how, like, it had little frightening spots coming out of it, so this guy was mad so he would have like raging and this guy over uh the green snake he has those three lines coming out of his eyes because he's like scared so the lines are showing like all emotional emotional uh feelings i think this is part of that guy's tail so that guy's tail is uh maybe it's been whacking them multiple times and uh just like the signs of fear, like this guy's mad for sure because he's like, I don't care about my tongue. I don't care if it's wailing in the wind. Uh, I, for me, per particularly think that this is uh, is definitely a more uh, aggressive scene than some of his other paintings. I have yet to meet uh, Runt, but I think that if I did, he he would be very uh like nice and uh i think he would be really creative and to have a great sense of humor i feel these creatures emotions almost so like when he's looking when this guy is looking at him and i'm like oh no what's gonna happen i want to know like the pictures don't move <laughs> i want to see what's gonna happen it's intriguing like i want to know what what's about to happen in the scene. Like, is this guy gonna fly away or is the whole world gonna end? Done. You know, when I first started doing it, I sort of blew it off because I thought like, you know, being an artist was sort of a stupid thing to do. But now as I get older, it uh, actually gives me something to take uh, pride in. 
And luckily, art's been something that's uh, traveled with me. It hasn't been totally not through wanting it. And actually, when I think of it, it's been the longest relationship I've ever had in my life. It's turned out to be the thing I've cared about the most, uh, whether I've liked it or not. This was one of five big pieces I had in 2012 when I had a show at Fafoon Electrique in Montreal. Most people just walk by, have a look, and they go like, oh, this kind of all this stuff. So it's as long as we get, I want, a, I want a total variety of people. I remember one time at least I had a section I didn't want to do and I couldn't figure out how to do it because I ran out of ideas. This is a direct ripoff. Uh, in my own way of, of Dr. Seuss's like musical instruments, which I so love, absolutely love, as a kid and even as an adult.